Hi, I'm Rex Black, president of RBCS. Welcome to the RBCS YouTube channel. Hey, I hope you enjoy all these free resources that are available here. And do us one favor. We need to keep the lights on and we need your help to do that. So, when you need testing and quality related services, training, consulting, expert services, you name it, let us be one of the bidders on that next job. We don't expect to get all of your business, but we'd like to get a chance. Thanks and enjoy the shows. Recorded live at Testing Stage 2017 in Kiev, my keynote, Agile V-Model, Oxymoron or Best Practice? Now, it's a very special moment uh, for me and for everybody on this event. Uh, the presentation that will be held first called Agile V-Model, Oxymoron or Best Practice. Uh, and I'm very excited about it because it was all my respect and honor uh, I want to invite at this stage person who dedicated almost all his life to software testing. Uh, he was president of the International Software Tester Qualification Board, co-author of uh, ICP Advanced Syllabus, uh, president of American Software Testing Qualification Board, and uh, he wrote more than nine big educational books. I think you all read them. Uh, many articles, and was the person who opened basically software testing to the great amount of people uh, on, on, on the earth. So he's the one who I can say is responsible for establishing the role of our software tester. Yeah, so all of us owe him a big thank you, a big hug, uh, a big bottle, and all for having our career. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rex Black. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, love your city, beautiful place. My second visit, I was here in 2013, so it's good to be back. So, uh, you know what that is? Any guesses? It's oil, which is dead dinosaurs concentrated dead dinosaurs. So sometimes things that are very old are still quite valuable. <laughs> like the ideas that are in the V model, that you might think, oh, very old, out of date. But actually, many of the best ideas in Agile come from the V model. You may not believe me, but I'm going to show you. So, uh, when people hear V model now, they think, oh, waterfall, oh, waterfall people, it's so boring, 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 waterfall. But, as I said, if you look at some of the best practices in agile, in agile testing, they actually trace all the way back to ideas that have been around in testing for 30, 40 years. So, like those dead dinosaurs in the front, old, concentrated and good, useful. Part of the confusion with the V model is the way we show it, we show it sequentially, yeah? This and this and this and this and this. And this yeah? If you think of the V model implemented sequentially, this waterfall. But what if we take away the idea of sequence? The, the rule that says we have to finish this before we start that. We have to finish that before we start that. But visually, the agile life cycle looks, looks very, very different. So you might think, where's the where's the V model in this? But actually, there are nine areas, at least, that I've identified that clearly trace back to concepts that grew out of the V model. But you have to remember that the, the V model was a way of changing the waterfall so that testing, instead of just being something that happened at the very end, is actually embedded throughout the life cycle. 
That's the whole point of these pieces, yeah? The early involvement. So if we think, well, what are the ideas there that don't involve sequence? In Agile, we are supposed to think about testing and quality throughout each iteration, not just something we do at the end. You hear people say things like, working software is the primary measure of progress. That we should emphasize technical excellence and good design. It's an Agile manifesto stuff. But where did that come from? Did a dozen or so people just make that up in a ski lodge in Utah one night? No, oh, actually. Uh, think about the V model principle of early testing and quality assurance. That's an idea that's been around for a long time. Dave Gelperin, Bill Hetzel, books that they wrote in the 1980s that were founding books of testing and how it works. Yeah, that's, it's in there. So, this idea of collaborative user story grooming at the start of each iteration. Testers helping to refine the requirements. Not a new idea. The D model idea. Uh, test driven development, acceptance test driven development, behavior driven development, test then code. This is something that Dave Gelbert was talking about in the 1980s when he was working on the original version of the IEEE 829 standard. So, these are not new, not new ideas. So, familiar with the, the term uh, three amigos, three amigos in, in Agile, yeah. Uh, Crispin and uh, Gregory's term from their book, uh, Agile Testing. It's the whole team approach. Developers, testers, business stakeholders collaborating. You have to do that to enable what I was just talking about, I this early QA and testing. Uh, so, where does this idea come from? To the V model. That was the whole idea of the cross arms of the V. Early involvement. Get the testers working with the developers and the business stakeholders to figure out well, what is it exactly we want to build here? Three amigos. Kill bugs at the source. The nasty bugs. The bugs we don't like, right? Kill them at the source. So, this is something that you hear in Agile of fix the bugs in the same iteration in which they were introduced. Don't let them pile up. Don't accumulate technical debt. Now, some of my clients say, well, we don't always fix all the bugs. But we fix the bugs first in the next iteration. And it's kind of like, eh, and then you know, hardening, stabilization sprints, now we let some technical debt accumulate and we deal with it. Agile purists say, oh, oh that's horrible. Don't do that. So it's accumulating technical debt. So is this an agile idea? Well, no. Because if you look at the idea of the V model, phase containment, phase containment says the defects should be detected and removed in the same phase in which they're introduced. The goal, 100% phase containment. Find and fix every single bug as soon as it was introduced. The shorter the lifespan, the less damage it does. Not an agile idea. Goes back way, way back. Uh, agile that is borrowing these ideas that have been around a long time. But we shouldn't think of them as agile ideas, but just best practices that have been around for quite some time. Yeah? Uh, so, regardless of your life cycle, it's always going to be cheaper. I need the higher quality. We find them and fix them sooner rather than later. Don't want to pile up. Acceptance criteria. User stories. Basically, how requirement is expressed in Agile. Yeah. Acceptance criteria. How we decide is this done? Okay, well, what are the acceptance criteria telling us? Well, they're saying 
what should be tested, which is in, ad, in ISTPV terminology, just the test conditions. Where did that term come from? The model, 1980s, Delbert, Edsel, their ideas. It also tells us in the acceptance criteria how to recognize working. What constitutes working software? It meets the acceptance criteria. So what does that mean that the acceptance criteria are? The test oracle. This is the ISDTV term for it. One that's been around for a long time. This is the Boris Beiser term. One of Boris Beiser's books, Software Testing Techniques, back in the 1980s. Uh, this idea of trying to clearly define what it means for the software to work. And if you know a little bit about Beiser's writing style, you read his books, you know he was kind of being ironic with this. Because the name Test Oracle derives from the Delphic Oracles in Greek mythology. And the way that the Delphic Oracles got away with foretelling the future is they always did it in a vague way. They could have multiple meanings. Just like our test oracles. Notice that? That's sometimes be a problem. We think it means one thing, other people mean think it means something else. So here's again where we need that collaboration with the business stakeholders, developers. So what exactly do we mean by this? What would working look like? You know, that's the, that idea of trying to eliminate the ambiguity of the test oracles is not, it's not a natural idea. It's an idea that goes way back. Long-standing B-model best practice. Acceptance test-driven development, behavior-driven development. Where did these come from? These ideas grow out of the B-model. Really, they did. Because you take the user stories and the acceptance criteria and you turn them into tests. Whether we're talking about acceptance test driven development or specification by example or behavior driven development, the same idea. I am trying to eliminate the ambiguity that I was just talking about in the test oracle by saying, okay, this acceptance criteria means this, right? Yeah, I'm going to translate it into tests as a way of eliminating that ambiguity. This is what working looks like. This is what successfully working software looks like. That's what we're trying to do with these tests. And this is design before code. Again, long-standing B-model best practice. Going back, Hetzel, Belkin, Pfizer. Pfizer had a funny way of putting it. He said, in one of his books, you don't even necessarily have to run these tests. He said sometimes just threatening to run the tests is enough. <laughs> the threat of a test is sufficient, Pfizer said. Now, threat is a strong word. I don't recommend that you threaten developers with tests. I'm going to test your software. Beware. <laughs> You shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be threatening them. But the idea that the advisor is trying to get across there, right, that, that by showing them the test, we are leading them to this is what, what we think you're going to build. And if they disagree, we can change the test. These are great ideas. They're just not agile ideas, specifically. They're B-model ideas. These are their agile manifestations. Definition of done. It's really that channel. Supposed to have a definition of done. Okay. This is something that's in Scrum. Talking about a definition of done. You read uh, Schwaber's book on uh, Scrum. Talks about the importance of having these defined. You've probably been on projects before where the definition of done wasn't so well defined. You hear the joke of it's done. But is it done done? Like, what does done mean? Okay, so this idea again, let's remove ambiguity about what we're trying to accomplish, what, what it would look like for us to have completed some activity or workflow. Why does that matter? 
for the same reason as in the V model for years we've talked about exit criteria. The point of exit criteria is make sure that you actually finish something before you start the next thing. It might depend on that thing. Because if it's not done, then it's not going to be very efficient. So again, an idea from the V model, exit criteria, with a manifestation in Agile, definition of done. The reason that people think of exit criteria as very different is because in V model projects, they are used to enforce sequentiality. This idea we have phase gates. People think, oh, well, the exit criteria are used for phase gates. We finish the requirements, then we start the design and so forth. But they don't have to be used that way. And really, people who came up with this phrase definition of done could just as easily have followed exit criteria. Brian Merrick was the only person involved in the creation of the Agile Manifesto who was actually a tester. The sole person carrying the tester flag at the meeting where they created the Agile Manifesto. So he came up with the four quadrants. You might think, oh, well, surely the four quadrants, and that's, that's Agile, that's like pure Agile. No, not entirely. It was a great idea. Big fan of Brian Merrick. Very smart guy. There's, there are original ideas here, but a lot of this is, again, traceable back to ideas out of the model. Like, for example, support the team versus evaluate the product. This basically means, if you look at it closely, make sure the software does what we said it was going to do, which is, in ISTQB terminology, just verification. You know that, that the definition, the ISDQB definition of verification and validation? You ever confused by that? It's really simple. All it, all it means, verification just means make sure it does what we said it was going to do. Or the team. Make sure that we built what we said we were going to build. Now, we could build what we said we were going to build, and it could still be crap. You know that joke? The user looks at the software and says, you gave me exactly what I asked for, but not what I needed. <laughs> yeah. So, does the requirements capture what we think the user asked for? And we test that, and that's verification, and that's great. But, is it what he or she needed? That's when you get to evaluate the product. That's validation. That's all that, that definition in the ISDQB glossary means. Validation. Make sure it does what the user actually needed to do. In other words, we need verification and validation because the requirements can never be a perfect capture of the user's needs. Right? So we've got to do both. And they're both important. Verification, validation, B model concepts. The idea of the different uh, levels of testing. Now, Merrick doesn't actually put these labels on it, but if you look at quadrant one, that's clearly unit testing under the ISTQ definition. And when he talks about a quadrant two, things like acceptance test driven development, behavior driven development, those sort of things, system level types of tests. Over here, quadrant three, exploratory tests, usability tests, scenarios. System test, user acceptance test, manual types of tests focused on validation from the user point of view. And then quadrant four here, technologically oriented quadrant, the validation side, liability, performance, security, operational acceptance test type of stuff. You see, it all it all maps back to these best practices that have been around for quite a while, testing best practices. Now, the difference is that in classic V model, the way we thought about it for years, you would do all of this before you do this. And then you would do all of this before you did that. And you would do all of that before you did that. Right? That's in a sequential life cycle the way that would work. But in Agile it says, Nah, all of these things can be going on at the same time. 
Again, back to my original point. If we take this idea of sequentiality out of the B model, a lot of what's in there just immediately transfers over or becomes the best practices. Now, here's another place you might think, oh, planning poker, you have that? That's clearly, clearly an adjoint thing. And it's, it's, you know, planning poker is a good idea. You guys have, have done it? Yeah? Done planning poker before, scrum, teams, estimation, and yeah, the playing cards, or the Fibonacci series, or t shirt sizes, or whatever, however you're doing it. Yeah? It's clever. Yeah, it's a good idea. Brainchild of uh, Mike Cohn. Mike comes up with this idea of planning poker. And got this idea and did, we don't just shout out our estimate, we pick a card, we wait, and everybody reveals it at the same time. That's to avoid something called anchoring. Anchoring is something that happens when somebody shouts out an idea, and now that shouted out idea dominates the conversation going forward. You want to avoid that. You think, oh, that's, that was really, that's a good idea. It's a good idea. But it's not Mike's idea. I mean, Mike changed it, reformulated it as planning poker. Planning poker actually is nothing more than the Delphic Oracle Estimation Technique, which has been around since World War II. It's the same idea. We are going to extract the wisdom and insight of the people doing the work in a way that avoids them buying, biasing each other's estimates. You build consensus after people have already fought independently. Go back and read up on Delphic Oracle, the origins of it, you'll see it's land cover, different name. And Delphic Oracle estimation has been something that we've been talking about in the model for as long as I've been a tester. Great idea. It's just not Agile idea, right? Now, when I say not an agile idea here, I'm not saying it's not an idea that can be used in agile. Of course, it can. What I'm saying is it's not an idea that originated from agile. It's an idea that agile is important. Now, you might think burn down charts. It's really burn down charts are agile. I love this. We got the good one here. Plan, actual. Yeah, that's looking pretty good, right? <laughs> this one here. All right, can you see the guy that's a burnout chart? The guy falling off there. Oh, OMG! <laughs> you been on this one? You get to the end, it's like, oh no, that's if we're supposed to be here, then we're here. It's like our planning poker session didn't quite do its Delphic Oracle trick for us. <laughs> didn't really foretell the future. An unhappy stick man falling off the end of the burnt down chart there. But, you know, this happens and you go, oh crap, well I guess our actual velocity is like this, not like this. So next time when you estimate, you're supposed to say, well this is what we can actually do. Because what we're doing is we're using metrics from past iterations to figure out how long things are going to take in this iteration and the next iteration. The next iteration. Where's that idea come from? The model. Again, go back and look at the foundation syllabus. You'll notice that it talks about two basic ideas of estimation. One, we just looked at on the previous slide, is this idea of the consensus of the people doing the work, estimation by experts and contributors. The other thing it talks about is estimation using metrics. Well, there you go. It's all over down chart is, it's all velocity is. Using metrics from past iterations to figure out what we can actually accomplish. So again, not an agile idea. It's an idea that's used by agile, and it's a good idea. But ultimately, it's a D-model idea. Hopefully, I've challenged your thinking a little bit on all those D-model ideas are just extinct dinosaurs. Well, they're actually transformed, maybe, like dinosaurs transformed into oil. They're just different, different form.
different form. But still value. I don't want to say that everything in the V model as traditionally used translates immediately into Azure. Because it doesn't. There are some things that you have to lose. So I this idea is once you life cycles of we do this, do all the requirements first, and then we do all the design, and then we do all the code, and then we start testing. And that sequentiality, no, you can't do that in Apple. That's like contrary to the entire idea of Apple. Right? Break it into little teeny pieces and build it one little teeny piece at a time. So we gotta get rid of that part. And we also have to get rid of the, the part sequential lifecycle models where we said, since we're going to try to figure out the requirements up front, once we finish that, no, no, no change to the requirements. Can't change the requirements because that's not okay in a sequential lifecycle model. Well, that won't work with Agile either because the whole idea is the product backlog can change. We're going to allow for course correction, right? Delivery at the end. We gotta lose that. We can't just sit around and go, oh, no, no. Someday I'll get software. It could be a few months. Remember that from V model projects? You work on the older, the sequential life cycle V models, and it's like, oh yeah. We do two or three months of test development and then we run the test all at once, right? Uh, uh, not an agile. We're just pretty much running tests all the time. So we gotta change the way we work to be able to handle that. So that's different. That's clearly different. And another big forbidden behavior in Agile is adversarialism. So you know, three three amigos. Right? Amigo in Spanish is friends, not three enemies. There is sometimes this idea that the tester is the process cop. I'm here to make you do things. Tell you, you developer, you must do this. You business analyst, do this. Yeah? I don't like the way you wrote the requirements. You have to give me requirements, right? I don't like the way you wrote that code. You didn't unit test it enough. You have to go unit test it more, right? Process cop. Can't be a process cop in Agile because that's not being one of the three amigos. So you gotta work with people, you gotta collaborate. Uh, you can't be a quality cop either. Quality cop, you know, the, the tester says, hey, no software gets past me, damn it. I get to say when it's ready to ship. Now, I, I alone determine the release. I've heard testers say this to me, like, I want to be the person who decides whether the software can release. No, you don't. <laughs> You only think you do because you've never been in that position. Be in that position once and you'll be like, oh God, no, please. Because you just can't, you can't get, you can't get that right. Because if you say, no, 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 we can't ship this, it's not okay. Then everybody says, oh, those testers, they're just in the way. They're slowing things down. Yeah. And then when you say, oh, okay, I guess you can put it in production. It goes out of production. The first thing happens, it fails. People come back, why'd you ship that? How'd you miss that bug? That's because, you know, you're, you're the quality cop. But if you say, no, we all own quality and I'm going to collaborate to help you achieve better quality, that's a different conversation. Yeah? So, now see, these ideas, they're not actually V model ideas. They're just ideas that got kind of stuck on to certain implementations of the V model. And people started to think of them as V model. But, you know, if you look at a lot of the uh, early work done on testing, these aren't, these aren't there. They're not in there. It's just stuff that got stuck on there later. And then people said, oh, well, that's the V model. This is the essence of the V model. No, it's not. <laughs> the essence of the V model. The essence of the V model are the nine things that I was just talking about, and as you see, those aren't inherently sequential. They work just as well in Agile because you know, we see all those things and think, oh, those are Agile ideas, but they're not. They're V model ideas. Um, 
things we need to keep. Independent testers. As a tester, you're the only person on the project, the only person in the Agile team, whose job it is to think about what could go wrong. You're there to worry about stuff. You are the professional pessimist. You gotta be professional about it. You can't be like, oh, the software is always crap, it never works, uh, right? That's, that's an unprofessional pessimist. That's just, you know, an irritating person. <laughs> but you have to be thinking, what could go wrong? Because the developer's thinking, how do I build this? Product owner's thinking, what do I want? You need somebody going, hmm, how could this not work? That's, that's you. That's the independent professional tester thinking about what could go wrong. Upfront design. Now there's, people say, oh, agile means no upfront design. Hmm. That's not a good idea. I've seen some big projects fail because people didn't sit down and think through, like, how is this database going to perform if we have 10 million records in it? So they didn't model that, and because they didn't model that, when they got to the point where they started testing with realistic data, they're like, oh, many-to-many -many joins across tables that have millions of records in them actually will not scale. Too bad, project fail, cancel. Seen it happen a couple years into the project, and collapsed because they didn't do design work up front. So you still got to do some upfront design. You got to think about it. How's this stuff going to scale? Doesn't mean that the design of individual pieces of code can't change, but you know, think about things like database structures and network uh, architecture and so forth. That stuff needs to be figured out up front. Now, not every test task can happen inside of an iteration. So there are some things that need to be done that aren't actually part of a single iteration. So put them outside. Like a lot of our clients have a separate automation team. Builds automation frameworks that are used across all of the different agile teams to do their automation. And that works for them. Performance testing. Clients that have specialized performance and reliability test teams. That's what they do. Provide performance and reliability testing teams. Development teams. Data? Test data? Test data can be a real big issue. You haven't thought about test data much. I had a uh, presentation that I did on this at uh, the Test Istanbul uh, conference last year. Uh, Enterprise challenges of test data management. You'll take a listen to that on my YouTube channel. This can be a big issue and not something that can be handled within a single iteration or a single team. Uh, Similarly, environments can be a large, complex issue. So sometimes having outside teams provide services to the agile teams makes sense. Hybrid life cycles. We have hybrid life cycles where it's kind of agile, but in some places it's something else. Like to give you an example, I was working with a client last week and they do uh, gaming software. Massive multiplayer online games, millions of people involved in this. Uh, so when they first come up with a character that they want to build for the game, they actually follow a spiral model. You know, spiral model, there's prototypes, they build prototypes, test prototypes. They actually do a bunch of iterations in the spiral until they're like, aha, now we know what this character can be like. Now we're going to build it out agile. It's a hybrid life cycle. It can change elements of both. Is that okay? If it works for you, it's okay. You have to be careful of this, this dogma, these rigid beliefs about Agile means this and not that. But I thought one of the Agile ideas was that we were supposed to focus on people and interactions over processes. So instead of saying agile means this process, it's like, well, people are working effectively together, then it must be agile. So tailor the life cycle. And keep defect tracking. There's some people who kind of import this idea out of lean, 
where you have lean concepts like you know, Kanban. You say, oh, don't track defects. Difficult to learn from mistakes when you don't gather information about them. You know, as Deming put it, without data, you are just another person with an opinion. You don't have data on what kind of bugs are being introduced. You can't study your mistakes. You're just another guy with an opinion. And you know, notice that people have opinion-based arguments and make opinion-based recommendations. That doesn't always really work out too well. Keep the defect tracking. Track those bugs. Study them. You can learn a lot by listening to your bugs. V model is dead. Long live the V model. And basically, people say, well, Agile, Agile has killed the waterfall. Okay, Agile killed the waterfall. Maybe, maybe not. But regardless of whether Agile killed the waterfall, Agile did not kill the V model. Now, we have clients that are still doing stuff that's sequential and still doing stuff that's uh, spiral and other, other life cycles. So I would I have accepted Agile and actually killed any other. Oh, it just became a new life cycle. But the ideas from Agile, a lot of those best practices came out of the new model. Unfortunately, you say, well, how, how did these play out before? Well, a lot of times they didn't. And it's funny that, that Agile, when practiced properly, is probably the best example of the V model you'll ever see. Probably more V model happening now than ever before. But what we have to do is get out of the idea of these pure dogmas of this, 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 you know, agile means this, punch means this, and say, well, let's just focus on doing what works. Do what works. This idea of it's got to be this or that, dualism, Nietzscheanism, it's this idea of the one or the other, ah, just do what works. Hey, we adapt, blend, extend. Focus on doing what works. Pick up these best practices wherever they're available. I hope you enjoyed this recording. For more like it, subscribe to the RBCS YouTube channel. If you need help implementing testing best practices in any life cycle, contact us at RBCS. Thanks.